let's go ahead and go into the first segment, which is going to be talking about every single Central Division team that's and their biggest questions going into this season. So, where to start? I wonder what team we should start. I mean, hmm. There's a lot of teams in the there. There's a couple of teams in the Central Division now. A lot of the teams in the Central Division aren't really that. How should I say? Um, they're kind of mid, I guess you could say. Some of them are mid. It's like um, it's one of those conferences where it's like you have the top and then you have the bottom of the bottom, and you'll see what I'm talking. About. You'll see what I'm talking about when I go into this. So first team I think I'm going to talk about is Chicago, and. Really, this team is a team that's going to be riddled with so many questions. What are they going to do with Zach Levine? How are they going to be like without um, DeMar DeRozan? Is Kobe White finally going to take that next step? There's so many questions for this team. But I think the biggest question for this team is what will Lonzo Ball's return look like? Now, Lonzo, since... Leaving the since leaving the Lakers, Lonzo Ball has arguably been one of the more underrated guards in the league, and one of the more underrated role playing guards. Now I know that as a number two overall draft pick, he wasn't meant to be just a role playing guard. However, his play greatly impacts um, the Chicago Bulls or any team that he's played with when he was, especially when he was on the Pelicans. Like he was. His strengths are playmaking and defense. And then while he was on while he was on New Orleans, he ended up developing a jump shot. Now on Chicago, he's perfected that jump shot. So now not only is he like a legitimately competent shooter, um, well not not excuse me, not only is he a legitimate playmaker, a legitimate defender, and a a decent scorer, he's also a much better shooter now, which was one thing that he struggled with when he was on Los Angeles. And a lot of people, they give a lot of praise to Lonzo for figuring out a jump shot because he put in the work and he tried to put in the jump shot, which is the only proof that you need. Lonzo Ball is living proof that Ben Simmons can develop a jump shot, but Ben Simmons just chooses not to. Like, living proof. But I digress. So, again, Lonzo Ball, he hasn't really played since January 2022, and the Bulls recently lost Alex Caruso to um, the Oklahoma City Thunder. So now they're sort of, they really need a competent 3 and D guard uh, to be able to pair alongside with Kobe White. And after setbacks and three knee surgeries, Lonzo might finally be able to make it back onto the court and play on the court. Because he is, like, again, he's solid. He's not like the player that everyone thought he was going to be back on UCLA. But he's solid. And he averaged 13 points, 5.4 rebounds, 5.1 assists in the 2021-2022 season. And, you know, I have a feel. I It's also going to be a little bit curious how this is going to look when he's paired up alongside Josh Giddy, who is another kind of, who is another playmaker. I don't, I'm not a big fan of him, for obvious reasons. And really pairing Lonzo up with somebody like him, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to mesh well with your lineup and um, your offense. But, you know, that's why we have to see what Lonzo's return is going to is gonna look like because maybe they'll mesh well, maybe they won't mesh well. Who knows? All right, so let's move on to the next team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, the Cavs, I mean, the way I see it, I think... My biggest question for the Cavs is, when is Donovan Mitchell leaving? Like, how long can you keep Donovan Mitchell happy to be in Cleveland? Because as much as people like making money, people also like winning. And if Donovan Mitchell isn't winning, maybe he's not going to want to partake in Cleveland anymore. And that might sour, and that might sour a lot of Cleveland fans. So we'll be entering year three with Donovan Mitchell in Cleveland. And he's going to be making $150 million in the next three years with a contract extension. And so he is committed with the Cavs, but it's how long will he stay committed and how long will he be, you know, be able to be happy while being on the Cavs roster. And there's a hierarchy in the East right now. So it's going to be the Celtics, the Knicks, and the Sixers 
occupying the groups of like a real, real contending team. Those three teams are real contending teams. More so the Knicks than the Sixers, and more so the Celtics than the Sixers, because I'm sorry, I understand Paul George, they, he's a very fantastic player, but I just don't have any faith in Philly. And Cleveland, they fall into like, um, not the same tier as the Knicks and like Celtics and Sixers, but a tier directly below that, where they could make it far, but nobody really legitimately thinks they're going to. And that's sort of like the category where they fall under in this, in this instance. And not to mention, Mobley averaged 16 points, 9 rebounds, and 2 assists, along with 2.2 blocks. So maybe this year they'll be even better, and he'll progress. But since we are going a little bit low on time, I am going to speed this up just a little bit. So the next team is the Detroit Pistons, one of the worst teams in the NBA last season. And if the Wizards didn't exist, I would call this team the worst team in the NBA. And the biggest question for the Pistons is... Which of the young players is going to make the next step? Because we've seen um, <clears throat> we've seen Cade Cunningham make that step. Now we need to see if there's going to be another player make that step and start playing very consistently. And one could argue that Cade hasn't made that step yet, so maybe Cade is going to be the one to make that step because he is putting up production just in garbage time. So maybe it's his time like this is his time to excuse me, I just drop my wallet maybe this is his time to become like the next person up and actually lead the team to wins or maybe somebody else is going to step up alongside with him and help detroit gain wins but as of right now kate cunningham he was coming off a career season tobias harris is going back to um detroit and detroit has like a, a lot of young players on the roster so it's totally possible that either one of those players could just end up sprouting as one of the better players in the on the team. And now Jalen Duran is one of, is a very popular pick. I think he could be one of those players that steps up. He averaged 13, 11 and 2 in the last in last season. And there's also a Sir Thompson who they have on the team. Now, he I believe he was out for most of the season. Again, I believe, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know, like, he did show glimpse of being an all-defensive caliber player, and it might not have been a sore, uh, it might not have been a sore, it might have been his brother, but I know it was one of the Thompsons that was out for a while. Next team is the Indiana Pacers, and now, and the biggest question that I have for the Pacers, and I think the biggest question that everyone has, is how will the Pacers look against healthy Eastern Conference teams? Because the only teams that they played in the postseason were teams that were injured. And even the Boston Celtics, they were injured when they went up against the Indiana Pacers. And, I mean, still got, still were able to sweep them. But aside from that, the Pacers, they really got as far as they got because of injuries. I mean, they didn't have to worry about Giannis. They didn't have to worry about Dame, even though they lost two games in the series. They did not have to worry about Julius Randle in... <coughs> against the Knicks, and they didn't have to worry about several other young, talented players on the Knicks roster that ended up getting injured going into Game 7. So, the big question, again, is going to be how are the Pacers going to play against a healthy Eastern Conference, and finally, the Milwaukee Bucks. Now, the biggest question for Milwaukee is going to be, can they stay healthy? And... Really, like, because the biggest problem that, that the biggest issue that they had towards the end was just not being healthy in the postseason. And if they can amend that problem, then I have a feeling that they're going to be one of the contending teams alongside with Philly, New York, and the Celtics. Now, unfortunately, that's what I would say if Doc Rivers wasn't their coach. But Doc Rivers is their coach, so I have a feeling that they're going to lose in the second round anyway. But if they didn't have Doc Rivers as their coach, I really think that this team would be in the contending spots the same way as Philly, New York, and Boston are in contending spots right now. They would be those, those would be the four teams that we see in the Eastern Conference semifinals, and those would be the four teams that are going to be competing for an Eastern Conference finals. And that's going to be... That's, if Doc Rivers wasn't the coach, I would definitely put them in that category, but... I can't do that because Doc Rivers is their coach, and I do not trust Doc Rivers. Let me know in the comments what you guys think of these questions. 
Let me know if you guys have different questions about all of these teams. But aside from that, we are going to go into a short break. And I'll be back to you with the second segment where I talk about Aja Wilson breaking the WNBA record for most points in a season. So I'll be right back after this short break. Be sure to stay tuned. Everybody. 